actually um, threefold. First, we're going to consider: was there any discussion? Is there any discussion from what we talked about before lunch? And then Yuta is going to talk to us about um, uh, history of animal welfare. And then Kushpu will give us some slides about some dairies in India, and we'll try and see what the problems are. So first, first up, any thoughts about the um, presentation I had? Any, any discussion anyone wanted? Any observations? Any comments? Did I get some statistics wrong? I think I got some very wrong, but... <laughs> well, it's only out by a factor of 10. <laughs> yes. I'll blame it on the computer. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, any any thoughts? Hopefully the principles were uh, reasonably sound. I have a question, but it's more yeah. around the yesterday's, uh, what we learned yesterday. Okay. So we learned about how to uh, calculate the energy requirements of uh, milking cows. Mm. But you see, we do have a lot of cow shallows and non-milking cattle. So how, and especially also the bulls, how do you um, calculate their energy requirements? Is it just sustenance? Russian that one has to provide them? Uh, uh, there, there are some fairly detailed standards for beef cattle which would probably be relevant for the bulls. For the non-productive um, dairy cows, yeah, again, that um, I think the uh, standards we did yesterday would be applicable, but just without that correction for milk yield. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only thing is that in India here, that I mean, you might well have a extra energy requirement for heat stress. Uh, you know, if the animal is having to pant or sweat, it all costs energy. Um, so that might be different, and I don't know whether anyone has ever looked at that. Similarly, the maintenance requirement for grazing is, you know, not relevant to housed animals. So it would need changing a little bit. Them yeah, them. so they're mature. Yeah, so they're yes. mature and they just live a decent quality of life. Yeah, yeah. It's a long, long time since I looked at the, um, the system for beef cattle, and I think that's based on a net energy system, not metabolizable energy for beef cattle. Um, hmm. Yeah, so if somebody is going to a gaushala and wants to improve the welfare, and how do you actually calculate that? Uh, because uh, in case of India, the government mm. also, there are some gaushalas which are partly supported by government, run on a PPP model. Yeah. So when that happens, how, how do they define that, you know, how much do they pay, what should be the rationing per animal? Mm. One of the difficulties, I'm sure, would be what energy content do you attribute to your low quality feeds? You know, if you're feeding rice straw in a gaushala, um, if you use the standard values which are used in the West for something like rice straw, it, you know, it's almost negative energy value. And yet, I'm quite sure, you know, in the Indian cattle, the, the dwell time in the rumen will be very long and uh, the bacteria there will be getting a lot out of the, of the food, which, th which won't happen in the West. So the energy values which had developed in the West would not be appropriate here, I think. Maybe that's a research gap. Yes, yeah, yeah, oh, a huge research I, gap. I think yeah. one has to work out the entire system for it. Mm. <coughs> and, uh, yes. I don't know our friends in India, like, right, may throw some light on that. And how do these equations, you know, the energy balance equations, which you, which you used yesterday, or we learned yesterday, I'm sure you know this. Uh, so how good are those balance equations, uh, or how well do they pertain to India, to the Indian cows, to, to the Indian breeds? And particularly, specifically, I think what Kushbi is asking is about cow shalas. How do we work out equations for cow shalas? Has, has it been done in the Indian context? It's a very important question, mm. uh, particularly from the welfare point of view. So we can use the same. No, but they, these are the producing cattle, and 
in Gaushalas they are not for production as such. Um, um, for maintenance purpose, of there are also the equations for maintenance purpose. Mm. Are there yeah. equations yeah. in ICR system? ICR system. Indian Council of Agriculture Research, yeah. they are their separate equations. They have based on live weight of the animal I guess and yeah yeah so the principles are the same but the but the equations might be a little bit different mm. Mm. well one of the problems with the system which we outlined yesterday um, is that it assumes that every extra liter of milk requires the same amount of extra energy to be fed you know, the nutritionists amongst you will know that that isn't true um, because the, the, the um, ME content, basically because the metabolizable energy content of the feed varies with how much is being fed. In an Indian context, in a Goshala, you know, as I say, ME content of the feed will be much higher than might have been estimated, you know, using equations yesterday. But for a high yielding cow, to, get, to move her from 30 litres to 31 litres um, it will take more food than it is to move that cow from 10 litres to 11 litres so you know that food is not food is not food it has different values for the animal anyone any comments on the, the presentation before lunch uh, you said about the, uh, relating the animal welfare to the feeding standards yeah mm. okay well we need to know what are the minimum feed requirements for welfare um, we have the minimum feed requirements for maintenance of the animal um, we need to know about the, the standards for, for welfare and the, the welfare is usually focused on basic behaviors can the animal stand up lie down uh, turn around, go and feed, etc. Um, now the, the maintenance requirements um, are related to the what we call the fasting metabolism. So that the, the original calculations to develop those equations were done on uh, animals which were fed small amounts of feed and actually there was a sort of extrapolation backwards what happens if we feed less and less feed to the animal will they maintain live weight and again there there are inaccuracies so that's extrapolation back to zero that's how the maintenance requirements were were determined um, we need something a lot more accurate than that how much energy do they need for the basic behaviors um, I did I give you some figures oh, a while back on um, the, the standard reference weight of livestock versus the critical weight. So that has some welfare connotations. That was related to the animal's behavior. So that was weight, it wasn't how much you feed them. Um, but you, so it would take some research to say, well, how much do we need to feed them to maintain that weight? It, has, it hasn't been done. And I think it needs to be done. Yeah, good, good question. Yeah. Any other? Yes. So um, uh, here in India, when research institutes conduct experiments, when it, where it involves use of animals, then we have a CPCSA committee uh, to ensure that uh, the ethics, the research ethics, are uh, to ensure the ethics of uh, the experiment, and uh, also to an extent because there is an animal welfare representative uh, in the committee to oversee that uh, the welfare is not compromised. Mm. Um, now, but still, um, like I have observed uh, in a lot of institutes <coughs> that, uh, especially for experiments related to nutrition, um, uh, when uh, the feed of the animal is to be restricted, the animal is also restricted for uh, round the clock. So yeah. 24 hours tethered in the same place <coughs> so that it cannot just move its head, uh, you know, um, more than the dimension of that trough where the feed is served. Yeah. So what are some of the red lines for your students or to conduct experiments in your university when nutrition experiments are conducted? Mm. Well, one of them is that the animals are not permanently tethered for more than a couple of days or so. Um, 
so, so no permanent tethering. Another is that we cannot um, inflict pain on the animals unless they can escape. Um, we, we cannot, you know, a lot of psychological experiments use electric shocks. We can't do that unless the animals can escape. We, we also can't use standard agricultural practices uh, unless we have pain relief. So a standard agricultural practice might be castrating uh, a cow, uh, sorry, castrating a, a bull. Yeah, we do, we do castrate cows actually in, in Australia, stop them breeding. Um, but, but there's more research done on castration of the male. And we, we're not allowed to do that under research parameters unless we um, provide pain relief, analgesics. Those are some of the constraints. Depends a bit how your committees are made up. And we have a lot of problems with our committees. I won't say our system is perfect. But our committee does have a veterinarian on it, it has a, um, a representative from the animal welfare community, and it has a lay person on the committee. One of the problems is that the scientists tend to um, dominate the proceedings a little bit. And what you end up doing is just tweaking the experimentation a little bit so it's more scientifically valid, not so that the welfare is better. So that's that's a real problem. The scientists end up arguing, how do you take this blood sample best? How do you take this sample? Uh, and what you really should be asking, do you need to take a blood sample at all because it's painful for the animal? And you see a lot of replication of research as in this one. It has already happened and we could avoid or maybe borrow certain findings from the other experiments. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I'm, yes, people say there is duplication in research. Uh, that definitely there is some research which should never be done. You know, I, I see some of that being submitted to journals, and I say that should not have been allowed to happen. That was too bad for the animal. And uh, then sometimes we say, no, we won't publish that paper because the animals were, were damaged too much. Um, I don't actually think there's a lot of duplication because it's like a spiral really, you know, you're learning more and more and every bit of research adds a bit more knowledge. Um, and what the, the main job of the committee is to say, is the benefit from that research worth the pain to the animals or worth the, the welfare problems for the animals? That's their only job as far as I'm concerned. They don't do that often. They just say, well, how can, yes, this research is going to happen. How can we make it a bit better? They should be saying, should this research happen at all? And if so, um, yes, how many animals are needed? There's as many experiments done with too few animals as too many animals. So you look at, uh, and someone did this research once. Where they looked at, I think it was the Australian Veterinary Journal. And they said, what proportion of the experiments published in that journal had too few animals or too many animals? Turned out 25% of them had too few animals to ever be able to prove what they were trying to prove. Um, so a lot of experiments are not designed properly. You know, you should always try and do some sort of power calculation when you're, det when you're prescribing how to do the experiment and how many animals you need. You do a power calculation. So not always very easy, but it should always be done. It's a good exercise to do it. Mm. So during nutrition experiment, we need to uh, test the animals for um, the experimentation period. Because if we take the animals for a stroll, it will increase the energy requirement. And we will not be able to determine the actual energy requirement which the animals spend during the strolling or being moving. So it will, it will defeat the very purpose of the experiment. Yes. So we need to restrict the animal in the experimental conditions during the experimental period. So we can't, we have to do that. So we cannot take animals and allow them to move freely. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, there is a potential problem with that, though, um, in that if the animal is very stressed by being tethered permanently when it's not tethered normally, um, or if it's in a very small crate, then that stress has huge impact on the animal's body. You know, stress pervades the whole of the, the function of the animal's system. 
um, it, it, it puts the animal on, on top alert, if you like. So the basal metabolic rate is increased, the nutrient requirements are increased. An animal that's stressed is not a typical animal. So I, ideally, you do want your animals in fairly normal circumstances when you're doing research. But I mean, I've worked with animals that have fistulates. Um, I, you know, I've, I've done metabolism studies uh, where the animals are in small crates. Um, and I think the one thing I would say, as you get older, you, you begin to realize some of the problems that the animals are facing and get, become a bit more sensitive to those. When you're young, like most of you are, you know, and your scientific career is, is all ahead of you, there's a temptation to um, think of you, I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't, but there's a temptation in some scientists to think of their career only and the next paper they're going to publish rather than thinking of the animals. Sheep on the vessel who had to travel along this route. So, we need to condition them to be tied for maybe a few hours a day, uh, yeah. first, and then you know, tie them for a day. Yeah, yeah. We're not allowed to tether for more than seven days. Uh, sorry, not tether, uh, metabolism crate not more than seven days because then the muscle starts wasting that might be not a good strategy because all the time in the metabolism crate the animal's movement is very restricted it might be better if they're only in for the period of metabolism five to seven days yeah. Yes, the stress factor is important. Yeah, I know it's standard practice, uh, but I, we don't. We we cannot um, have them in a metabolism crate for more than one week, total. Yeah, it'd be something like that. Yeah. Mm. But uh, of course, there are you know new ways of doing it. You can use markers. You know, you've got to ask yourself, I think, do you have to have a metabolism crate? Can you use markers um, in, in the room and you can, you can put markers in to look at the dilution rate and, you know, you can, you can do a lot without the metabolism crate. The metabolism crate really is only for a whole animal balance um, and, or a digestibility study and maybe you don't need that. So you can do a lot with with other methods and with models. Markers. Yes, because, because it's easy, I think, isn't it? Uh, pretty good. Which markers are you using? Chromium dioxide and polyethylene glycol? Yeah. There's a problem with chromium, chromium dioxide in that it sinks to the bottom of the rumen. It's very heavy. And so the turnover is not normal. But for the liquid fraction, PEG, polyethylene glycol, is fairly accurate, I thought. There are rare earth markers now, which uh, I've never used those, but... Uh, they, they're more accurate than the chromium dioxide, chromium oxide, oxide is it? Yeah, okay. Yes. Good. Any other comments on our before lunch talk? Uh, animal welfare versus uh, production of milk or cattle products. So, so where do we uh, find the balance or do we find the balance at all? The first question. Second question is, how far are we uh, from an animal model when mm. it comes to cattle? So, 
So only if we have a model, then we will know when the limit was crossed or when the barrier between a good animal welfare and a bad animal welfare. Okay, not an experimental model, um, a sort of welfare model. Well, welfare models which are built from on the basis of experiments. Yeah. There are many, many experiments. That right, do. okay, yeah. So is anybody working on a model? Uh, yeah. This has been done in biology or in right. Right, uh, sciences. Do that's we have anything uh, in the nutrition or ca cattle? Yes, that, that first question is really fundamental, welfare versus productivity. I mean, when you look at the factors affecting productivity, I like to think that mostly it's a win-win situation. If you improve welfare, you actually improve productivity. It's not a conflict. Um, so what factors affect the productivity? Uh, well, the, the, the primary factor is the quality of the person, the, the quality of the stock personship, or stockmanship if you like. How well are the cows being looked after by the person? If that's done well, the cows will produce more milk uh, and they'll be happier. So, you know, training of the people is the number one um, factor which will help to improve animal welfare. Um, and then other factors, you know, like cleanliness. Um, if you improve the cleanliness in the shed, you improve the quality of the milk product and you improve the welfare of the animals. Now I know we've focused a lot on you know, those really intensive cows producing a lot of milk but a lot of metabolic problems, but that's only because that's the topic of this, this, uh, work, this series of, of lectures, you know, nutrition and welfare. But there are, there are much more important things influencing welfare which are a win-win situation. The animal wins um, and the farmer wins because there's more milk being produced. By and large, I don't see it as a conflict. I see it as benefits for both. If the farmer can be encouraged to look after his animals better, then you know the cows will produce more milk. Cows are very sensitive animals. If they're mistreated, if they're anxious, um, they won't let down their milk. Uh, well, uh, why I ask you this question is because I have had the opportunity of first-hand experience and farmers, are refu farmers refuse to understand this, or the farmers re refuse to accept this. Mm. And I think for good reason. Because they keep on seeing literature, keep on seeing the evidence of intensive farming, and as a mm. result, they think that well, that's really glorified. Right. So, going away from now, when we talk about welfare, I, talk, I, I, I start to understand or imagine things that I've seen as a child. You know, the mm. milkman bringing the bringing the cow and, and milking it at, at every doorstep. Mm. So that, I think, is the ideal welfare situation. Now, do you think that's a win-win situation? I, I, I don't like, think... I think you yeah. made an example of, uh, of the calf bunting the, yes. the others to, so as to get uh, the poisons out of it. Mm. So I think that would be a welfare situation, which is a win-win situation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So why should somebody go into the intensive farming Mm. It's, a, it's a grab for cash, I think. Um, you know, it's a short way, a quick way to make, make money because the cows will quickly produce high milk yields. But in terms of sustainability of the system, it, it's very poor. You know, those cows will not last long. That would really go against the Indian man's grain, I think. It would really be very unhappy to, you know, you, you buy an expensive Holstein Frisian cow, maybe has come in from the West, it lasts two seasons. Uh, it doesn't get back in calf, it's not producing much milk, it's got, become lame, it looks thin and horrible. You know, that, that's very bad news. So it's a dash for cash, I think. They want money quickly. I, I, I wouldn't, I think it's quite dangerous to think that um, yeah, the uh, original ways that we kept cattle were always better than the ones that we have nowadays. Um, sometimes they were, but you know, if you go back a hundred years, then ca a lot of cows would have been very short of feed. I think very early on I put up a slide which had a, a, an old cow shed in Switzerland 
uh, and a cow peering out of it. And then I, I had another slide which was, you know, a feedlot or something with thousands of cows. And I said, which one has got the better welfare? And I honestly didn't know. I, I wouldn't say it was necessarily the, the old cow shit. Damp inside, dark, smelly, you know, hard to get feed in. Um, so, but at the same time, some of the modern systems are very good. Uh, we, we shouldn't go away and think they're all bad. But that uh, cow shed in Switzerland, they have survived for thousands of years. Yes, yes, that's sustainability. Right. That's true, yes. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely true. Um, but I, I wouldn't want people to go away and think, you know, everything that's modern and intensive is bad. Um, in terms of purely building design, you know, look at some of the new cattle sheds that are being put up with really high roofs. In, in hot conditions, you get beautiful ventilation uh, for the cows because the roof is so high. Um, much better than that Swiss cow shed. Yeah, now whether, it'll, whether the shed will survive, you usually give it a 20 year write off time, but um, the, the modern cow shed, but uh, the principle is good. Our, our ability with modern materials to build you know, excellent quality cow sheds is, is much better than it was 50 years ago. Good, any other points? Okay, let's, let's move on to, um, so Yuta is going to tell us about uh, history of animal welfare. Are you standing or do you want to sit? Yeah. Okay. Is that fine, the mic? Yeah? Okay. Bit of change in direction. Um, so I'm going to try and just go back a few thousand years and just right to the origin of kind of Christianity, early Christian period, and we'll try and figure out how this whole concept of welfare started, what very early philosophers thought of it, and how it evolved in the West, and then I'm going to jump to India, go back to the Indus Valley civilization, and try and see how the cow became so important in our own history. So just a bit of a comparison. Um, Sorry, if I'm the only English speaker, you to do... Oh, I, can't, no, I can't lecture in Hindi. My Hindi isn't that good. Right. I think most people are okay. I'll, I'll try and keep it simple. <laughs> I'll try. Um, four major religions of the world. Um, just for this lecture, I'm just going to bunch Christianity and Islam together because they had the same origins and Hinduism and Buddhism kind of have the same origins. So we're just going to consider two. Um, this is one of Arvind's maps, just where different religions uh, exist. Islam in the middle, Christianity in the Western countries, Buddhism and Hinduism in Asia. Uh, so. Christianity and Islam, uh, well, Christianity mainly, uh, there's a quote over there from one of the early, the Old Testament, um, Arvind had this in his slide. Essentially, uh, their philosophy is that m God made man in his image and then he populated the earth with plants and animals for the subsistence of humankind. Uh, it's come to be known as a dominion theory. So basically, it's, there's a hierarchy. It places God on the top, humans second, and then animals um, last, animals and plants last. Um, so around that area, early Christianity, if you look at what some of the philosophers thought, um, for example, Aristotle, he believed that because animals don't have rational thought and reason, they can't have a soul, um, and hence anything that doesn't have a soul doesn't get a moral stand. So we don't have to consider its well-being because it doesn't have a soul. Um, and o this kind of thought most likely originated from Christian belief, uh, where man was placed on top and
about our animals when they are alive and being used for production dairies mein तो हम लोगों ने पांच प्रकार की ऐसी जगह आइडेंटिफाई की जहां पे आपको पशु मिलेंगे जब वो मिल्क के लिए आ, या रिसर्च पर्पसेस के लिए सकते हैं सो आप फर्स्ट कैटेगराइज कैटेगरी इज द फार्मर्स द स्मॉल होल्डर डेयरी जिसमें कि आप एक दो जो पशु है वो गांव में फार्मर्स के पास रहता है द सेकेंड कैटेगरी इज द लार्ज कमर्शियल डेयरीज जो कि अभी नई डेयरीज हैं जो कि अभी बन रही हैं दे आर द न्यू मशरूमिंग टाइप इन द कंट्री एंड द थर्ड वन इज पेरीअर्बन एंड अर्बन डेयरीज कि जो शहर हैं शहरों में पहले क्या होता था कि सबके पास गाय होती थी सब अप, आ, आपके पास होती थी या पड़ोसी के पास होती थी और सब लोग फ्रेश मिल्क लेते थे बट फिर क्या हुआ जब शहरों में अब अब हम स्मार्ट सिटीज बना रहे हैं पहले जब शहरीकरण हुआ या अर्बनाइजेशन हुआ तब ये जो लोकल मुनिसिपल लॉज हैं उनके अकॉर्ड उनकी वजह से सभी जानवरों को या डेयरी ओनर्स जो थे उन्हें शहर के आसपास पेरीफ्री में प्लॉट दे दिए गए जिसको हम कहते हैं पेरी अर्बन डेयरीज वहाँ पे जो कि शहर से थोड़ा दूर होते थे लेकिन इतना भी दूर नहीं होते थे कि मिल्क की कॉस्ट हाई हो जाए तो वो फ्रेश मिल्क सप्लाई कर सके और फ्रेश मिल्क की क्योंकि ऑर्गेनाइज डेयरी सेक्टर भी इतना नहीं इस्टेब्लिश था उस समय तो जब ये शहरीकरण हुआ और आ, सारे पशु पेरीफ्री में चले गए तो उसको हम अर्बन एंड पेरी अर्बन डेरीज कहते हैं फिर हमारी बची एक तो गौशाला जिसके बारे में अभी उत्तरा ने बताया और आपके रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट्स गवर्नमेंट फार्म्स एंड रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट्स इन सभी जगहों में से रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट्स के एनिमल्स को हम अलग रखेंगे क्योंकि वो नॉर्मल प्रोडक्शन में यूज करने वाले एनिमल्स नहीं है वो स्पेसिफिक पर्पज के लिए हैं और अभी इस प्रेजेंट uh, uh, इन पांच जो मिल्क प्रोडक्शन सिस्टम्स आप कह सकते हैं उसमें से हमने जो पाया है कि जो सबसे वर्स सिस्टम है जहाँ पे एनिमल्स की जो क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ है वो बहुत बुरी है या इट इज नॉट इवन वर्थ लिविंग इज द अर्बन एंड पेरी अर्बन डेरीज जो कि शहर के अंदर या शहर के आसपास डेरीज हैं तो या तो वो गाय हो गई जो कि आपको सड़क पर कूड़ा खाती हुई दिखती हैं या फिर वो गाय हो गई जो कि आपको शहर के आसपास जो कि दूध वाला भैया दूध लेकर आता है जिसका जो मेनली गाय या भैंस कोई भी तो अभी हम सिर्फ इस प्रेजेंटेशन के लिए जो वर्स्ट फॉर्म ऑफ मिल्क प्रोडक्शन सिस्टम है अर्बन एंड पेरी अर्बन डेरीज उसके बारे में बात करेंगे तो ये जो है ये दिल्ली के आसपास की डेयरीज के विजुअल्स हैं लेकिन मैंने जो हमारी सिक्स मेट्रो सिटीज हैं सिक्स मेट्रो सिटीज में इन्वेस्टिगेशन कराया है और उसका जो फाइंडिंग है इट्स इट्स अ सेम देर इज नो डिफरेंस मे बी इट्स जस्ट वर्स देन व्हाट यू विल सी हियर सो सबसे पहले जैसे डिफरेंट एनिमल हजबेंडी पैरामीटर्स हैं हाउसिंग है तो हाउसिंग किस तरीके से होती है एक छोटा सा uh, आप पाएंगे कि एक छोटा सा एक एंट्रेंस है वहाँ पे अंदर या तो लाइट है या नहीं है यूजली परमानेंट टेदरिंग होता है एनिमल्स का यहाँ पे कॉन्क्रीट पे हाउस किए जाते हैं uh, अर्बन और पेरी अर्बन डेरी में मेनली बफलोज मिलेंगे और बहुत कम जो हैं गाय मिलेंगे लेकिन अब गाय भी काफ़ी आ गई हैं बफलोज किस लिए पाए जाते हैं यहाँ पे मिल्क प्रोडक्शन हाई होता है जो हाई फैट मिल्क लोग इस्तेमाल करते हैं शहरों में अभी भी प्रेफर करते हैं उनके लिए प्लस इट इज़ ईजियर टू डिस्कार्ड बफलोज जब बफलो एक बार स्पेंड हो जाती है तो गाय तो मुसीबत बन जाती है ना कि उसको मैनेज कैसे करें बट बफलो को आप सेल कर सकते हैं मीट के लिए वो कैटल मार्केट में सेल हो जाती है और आप वहीं से नए बफलो खरीद के ला सकते हैं तो एक जो लीगल एनवायरनमेंट है हमारा उसको ध्यान में रखते हुए भी यहाँ पे बफलो ज्यादा होती है देन यू सी दैट यू नो डेड मेल मेल काव स्पेशली आर ऑफ नो वैल्यू टू द डेयरी इंडस्ट्री बिकॉज द काव्स आर नॉट बींग यूज फॉर बीफ एंड अकॉर्डिंग टू द लॉ यू हैव टू एट लीस्ट रेज द काव फॉर सिक्स मंथ्स अगर आप छः महीने तक उसको रेस करेंगे तभी आप उसे लीगली बेच सकते हैं तो क्या करते हैं जब मेल का फायदा होता है तो उसे या तो भूखा मार देते हैं या फिर उसको जो अगर जैसे बहुत सारे काफ्स को पैदा होते कुछ डिसीजेज हो जाते हैं तो हम अटेंड करते हैं ना बिकॉज एनिमल्स आर अंडर आ क्या है बट मेल काफ्स को हम नहीं करते बिकॉज वी इट्स अ मुसीबत है ना जैसे बहुत से डेयरी के डेयरी फार्मर्स मुझे कहते हैं मेल काफ्स तो हमारे वो गले की रस्सी है है ना हमें किसी तरह उसको डिस्कार्ड करना है तो जैसे एक बार ये गाजीपुर ये मसूदपुर डेयरी है दिल्ली में तो मसूदपुर जो कि वसंतगुंज के पास पड़ता है वहाँ की ये फोटो है मेल काफ जो है वो ऐसे फुल व्यू में यहाँ बच्चे आसपास खेल रहे थे उसके 
So, uh, the kids were playing around this calf uh, and uh, uh, that is the condition that you will find. It is a typical condition to show uh, the con uh, how animals, uh, what lives animals are living in these urban and peri-urban dairies. Then you have uh, round, the uh, round the clock uh, tethering in their own ways. So, animals are sitting, standing in their own dung and urine. Sometimes one animal can sit, then only you know, uh, one, uh, the other animal has to stand, then only one will get space to sit. फिर आपने ये बहुत ही कॉमन साइट है जो कूड़ा खाते हुए सड़कों पे गाय दिखती है तो ये क्यों दिखती है और इसका हम क्या कर सकते हैं ये एक बार जब दिखती है जब ये किसकी गाय है जो सड़क पे खाती है कूड़ा ये कोई स्पेंट कैटल तो नहीं है सब दूध वाली गाय होती है या फिर आपको बुल्स दिखते हैं जो छोड़े हुए होते हैं मेल काप्स तो ये जो गाय है ये लोकल डेयरी वाले की गाय होती है मतलब इसके आपको एक किलोमीटर के अंदर अंदर आपको डेरी मिल जाएगी अगर आप किसी से भी लोकल पान शॉप और यूल गो टू एनी पर्सन एंड आस कि किसकी गाय है ये वो बता देंगे कि इसकी गाय है सब लोग देर इज अ गुड नेटवर्क वेर पीपल कीप एन आई बिकॉज एवरीबडी वॉन्ट्स मिल्क तो सुबह शाम जिन लोगों को चाहिए होता है तो ये जो गाय है इसका भी जो हम कहते हैं स्ट्रे कैटल इज एन इश्यू राइट और यू नो पीपल मीटिंग विद एक्सीडेंट्स बिकॉज ऑफ कैटल एटलीस्ट इन द सिटीज इज एन इश्यू लेकिन वो इशू कहाँ से आया वो डेरी इंडस्ट्री से ओरिजिनेट हुआ है तो आ, ये आपको अर्बन डेरीज में आ, एक टिपिकल प्रॉब्लम है यू विल सी दैन एनिमल्स आर नॉट प्रोवाइडेड एनी वेटनरी केयर सो ओपन वूड सोर्स इस तरह से ये एक काफ है जिसकी जो टेल बोन है वो एक्सपोज थी एंड नो बडी यू नो हैज अटेंडेड टू हिम मेल uh, काफ था ये ऑब्वियसली क्योंकि मेल काफ है तो उसको कोई भी किसी भी प्रकार का uh, जो है केयर नहीं दिया जाएगा है ना तो uh, ये वहाँ पे बंदे होते हैं जब आप डेरी में जाएंगे ना तो डेरी क्या होता है डेरी क्लस्टर्स होते हैं कॉलोनी होती है सो दे विल बी अबाउट फिफ्टी डेरीज इन वन कॉलोनी एंड देन ईच डेरी विल बी द सेम देर इज नो ग्रीन फॉर्डर वील कम टू द फीड पार्ट लेटर बट वहाँ पे आपको बहुत सारे काफ भार बंदे होंगे वो सारे काफ जो होंगे वो मेल काफ होंगे अंदर भैंसे बंदी होंगी या गाय बंदी होंगी चौबीस घंटा अंदर जाके इतना स्मेल आ रहा होता है कि आप सांस नहीं ले सकते लाइक फॉर कपल ऑफ ईयर्स वेन आई एस टू गो टू दीज डेरीज आई ऑलवेज यूज टू गेट सम इन्फेक्शन once i am out of these places now i go with a mask and i am not afraid to tell them that you keep them in a very bad condition and that's why i cannot even breathe here uh this is the kind of feed we have been talking about uh, animal farm animal nutrition and these are farm animals who are not obviously kept in any of the conditions that can uh, uh, suggest a farm to uh, in the surroundings in which they have been housed सो दिस इज द काइंड ऑफ फीड जो ब्रेड हम लोग खाते हैं और वो एक बार एक्सपायरी डेट होती है ना ब्रेड की तो वो जब एक्सपायरी डेट निकल जाती है तो वो ब्रेड कहाँ जाती है कहीं कूड़े में तो जाती नहीं है ये एनिमल ओनर्स इसको खरीद लेते हैं और फिर एक ही पूरा ट्रफ में पानी ब्रेड थोड़े ऑयल केक्स होते हैं उसके अंदर और जो भी उनको डालना होता है वो डाल के इसको ऐसे फीड किया जाता है ये पानी है आप देख सकते हैं इसमें कुछ भी पानी में जो पानी की पाइप है वो है सिरिंज है एलगी है दिस इज द क्वालिटी ऑफ वाटर वी आर फीडिंग सो आई वांट टू इन द लाइट ऑफ द कोर्स यू नो कंटेंट्स दैट यू हैव जस्ट लर्न आई वुड लाइक टू रिफ्लेक्ट यू टू रिफ्लेक्ट ऑन दैट वॉट वुड बी द कंडीशन ऑफ द एनिमल्स हु आर ईटिंग और ड्रिंकिंग दिस काइंड ऑफ um edible stuff so called edible uh, uh, this kind of you know who are being offered this kind of food and water and they have no choice because you know they are uh, they are tethered so there are a couple of more pictures i'll just go through uh, the pictures um do you just want me to you have opened it anyway right okay so there are just one or two pictures like ye anybody familiar with this khal bachcha yes kya hota hai ji jaise ji jo matlab bhains ke bachche hote hain khatam ho gaye to usko khal nikalwa ke aur ha ha तो ये भैंस का जो क्योंकि भैंस में भैंस जो है वो अपने बच्चे के बिना दूध नहीं देती है तो अगर वो मेल काफ है तो उसको सब कहते हैं कि जब भी मेल काफ होता है ना आप किसी भी टाइप की डेरी पे जाएं सब कहते हैं अरे अरे काफ तो मर गया है ना लेकिन वो मरता नहीं है उसे मारा जाता है 
उसको आप अटेंड नहीं करते हैं आप उसको केयर नहीं देते हैं तो वो क्या होता है वो तड़प तड़प के मर जाता है और क्योंकि हमें दूध चाहिए इसलिए तो हमने रखा हुआ है उसको पशु को तो दूध चाहिए तो वो एक आदमी को बुलाया जाता है जो कि उसकी खाल निकाल के उसमें भूसा भर के उसको सिल देता है और इसको जब दूध निकालने का टाइम होता है तो भैंस के पास ले जाया जाता है वो सूंघती है उसे लगता है मेरा बच्चा है और वो दूध उतार देती है है ना वो दूध उतार देती है और फिर दूध निकाल लिया जाता है ये ये जो वायल में क्या है आपको पता होगा ऑक्सीटोसिन कहते हैं ऑक्सीटोसिन है लेकिन ऑक्सीटोसिन बहुत एक्सपेंसिव होता है तो आ, आपके एनडीआरए में मुझे कुछ साइंटिस्ट ने बताया जो कि रिसर्च कर रहे थे कि आ, ये जो वायल्स में मिलता है वो कहते हैं कि ऑक्सीटोसिन है ये एक्चुअली ऑक्सीटोसिन नहीं है ये कुछ और हॉर्मोन्स का भी कॉन्कॉशन है जो कि स्लॉटर हाउस में जो एनिमल स्लॉटर होते हैं उनके पिट्यूटरी ग्लैंड में से एक्सट्रैक्ट करते हैं तो इसमें कुछ ऑक्सीटोसिन है लेकिन सब ऑक्सीटोसिन नहीं है तो हमें पता भी नहीं है ऑक्सीटोसिन चलो अगर है तो हमें पता है कि इम्पैक्ट क्या है एनिमल पे बट इफ यू डोंट नो वॉट इज बींग इंजेक्टेड सो वी 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 के नॉट पॉसिबली नो दैट वॉट इज वॉट इज इट डूइंग इन वॉट हैवो कट इज इट इज प्लेइंग इन एनिमल्स बॉडी सो so, ये हमें दिखा रहे थे कि हम इतना इतना लगाते हैं सुबह शाम एक एक भैंस को दूध उतारने के लिए ये देखिए ये क्वालिटी ऑफ वाटर है जो कि इसके लिए सफाई के लिए यूज होता है पशुओं को पिलाने के लिए यूज होता है और ये जो दूध के बर्तन हैं वो भी इसी से धुलते हैं और फिर इसमें दूध डाल के सबको डिलीवर किया जाता है अब वो कितना धुलते हैं दैट इज क्वेश्चनेबल आप देखेंगे डेरी में सभी जगह यहाँ पे वेस्ट वाटर जो ड्रेन्स हैं वहाँ पे इस तरह के बिना लेबल के जो वायल्स हैं वो आपको मिलेंगे इमेजिन दू नो लाइफ ऑफ दीज बफलोज हु हैव टू बी टेदर्ड एट द सेम प्लेस एंड लुक एट द फ्लोर अंडरनीथ एंड दे डोंट इवन हैव अ प्रॉपर फ्लोर टू स्टैंड और सिट एंड यू नो हैव टू सिट इन देयर ओन डंग एंड यूर इन ऑल द टाइम um and there could be a possible contamination in milk as well uh, there is a lot of frothing uh, uh, you know from the uh, um, from the mouth of this buffalo so what could be the possible reason for that is it the heat stress heat or stress, yeah yeah so you can see visible you know can see symptoms of heat stress heat stress um, bloating maybe frothy bloat okay so yeah yeah and then you know the body uh, if you look at the bod uh, bodies of the animals and uh, these dairies then you will see uh, some of them do not have any hair or some of them have turned pink or uh, you know uh, they they are no longer of their natural color some of them are brown buffaloes so you'll see them in different shapes sizes colors Uh, this is kal bachcha again and that's all repeated so that's it uh, all that i wanted to you know uh, the point that i want to make here is that um, you know these are the conditions so this is another picture i don't know why why it didn't show but then this is again gazipur uh, where um, the dairy colony is just next to one of the biggest garbage dumps in delhi so you can imagine the kind of environment and the air quality that uh, these animals and not just animals you know people the workers who are working these animals are living and you can imagine the kind of stockmanship that they must be able to uh, offer to these animals just because of the conditions in which they are operating um so this garbage dump actually crashed few days ago and because of which the government has stopped drum dumping any more dung you know it's always uh, on fire at certain places so you know there is a, a, a lot of air pollution in fact there is also a slaughter house next to this place so you can imagine the kind of conditions these animals are living in um again the quality of water here and um sorry yes i don't know it's not showing as slide show but i can just show you like in this view and then uh, feed store especially we talk about providing feed to the animals um, even in the villages in the small holder area we have seen that uh, uh, maybe i added them later so there is some problem with uh, that yeah i just have two slides to go 
yeah so with feed storage you will see that you know the feed is all wet and sometimes people are staying in the same room as the feed store so uh, it's not really uh, preserved well the way it should be um, again you know this is a bottle that I confiscated we don't know whether it's oxytocin or not um, at world animal protection we have been asking the organized milk sector to go away with these dairies and actually commit to uh, you know not source uh, and declare that they don't source any milk from such dairies plus you know we ask them to address these uh, urgent needs of animal welfare in dairy industry for milk producing animals so that we can have a sustainable dairy as a result of which the animals will have a decent life plus we will have a quality f food product as well as you know there will be less animals on the streets and less pressure on gaushalas so we all need to address the root cause हम लोग जो भी इस रूम में हैं हम लोग डेरी इंडस्ट्री में हम डेरी इंडस्ट्री लेवल पे और एनिमल प्रोडक्शन लेवल पे काम करेंगे तो हमारी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी और भी ज़्यादा है कि हम किस तरीके से उनका वेलफेयर जो है उसमें इन्हांस करें जिससे कि वो पशु जो है ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा जो है फार्मर के पास रहे जो कि उससे इस्तेमाल कर रहा है लेकिन एक सस्टेनेबली सस्टेनेबिलिटी uh, आएगी इस सेक्टर में जो कि अभी बिल्कुल नहीं है क्योंकि कोई रेगुलेशंस भी नहीं है और कोई अंदर से इच्छा भी नहीं है किसी की तो ये uh, पानी खाना वेटनरी केयर पशु अबैंडन uh, नहीं करना है दीज आर द टेन अर्जेंट थिंग्स दैट वी हैव आइडेंटिफाइड दैट्स इट थैंक यू इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन so these dairies these dairies are obviously thriving because buffalo milk is very expensive it sells at around 50 rupees 55 rupees a liter so the condition of the workers in these dairies is very bad because they're just seasonal workers but the dairy owners are thriving dairy owners because because it's a it's a low cost high output uh, uh, system right you're not putting anything for your animals or for your staff or you know towards their welfare and you're just getting high fat milk which is in high demand in the market and is being purchased at a very good price so they have people who buy milk in wholesale so it's not just door to door distribution so all the sweet shop owners who want to have khoya for example they buy milk from the buffalo uh, you know for, uh, they buy buffalo milk or uh, for example uh, if you'll go to keventers they just buy buffalo milk right so uh, all these flavored milk pe uh, brands uh, which are coming up in the market who need high fat milk to develop certain products that they are selling ma'am jo findings hai aapka isko aapne हाँ बहुत जगह रेस किए हैं और हम लोग काम कर रहे हैं आई विल शो यू जो एन के साथ ही काम कर रहे हैं नेशनल डेयरी मैनेजमेंट प्रैक्टिसेस बनाए हैं एंड वी आर ट्राइंग टू इम्प्लीमेंट इट और अगर नेशनल डेयरी मैनेजमेंट प्रैक्टिसेस पॉलिसी में आ जाएंगे तो ये ऑटोमेटिकली डिसक्वालीफाई हो जाएंगे तो इनके पास कोई ऑप्शन नहीं बचेगा इधर Uh, या तो ये अपनी कंडीशन सुधारें एनिमल्स की कि स्टॉकिंग डेंसिटी कम करें और uh, uh, जो प्रोविजन है बेसिक रिक्वायरमेंट्स फूड वाटर उसको ठीक करें या फिर दे हैव टू द गवर्नमेंट हैज़ टू डिसाइड वेदर दे शुड एग्जिस्ट और नॉट बिकॉज इट्स नॉट जस्ट एन एनिमल वेलफेयर इश्यू इट इज़ अ फूड सेफ्टी कंसर्न यू नो आर आर किड्स एंड एल्डरली एंड द सिक दे आर डिपेंडिंग ऑन द मिल्क प्लस इट्स एन एनवायरमेंटल इशू You you can see how these dairies are just uh, um, you know these dairies are uh, just choking all these uh, common uh, sewage systems. Plus they are discarding their animals on public land. Kids were playing around these dead animals, and you know what are we exposing our kids to? So we really need to start raising these questions. And you can go to the World Animal Protection website in India, and you have more information on it. You can always contact me. but uh, we really need to think about whether we should be supporting such systems or not and what kind of systems we have to go forward to government control hona chahiye lekin enforce nahi hota सरकार के हिसाब से municipal laws hain jo ki inke upar lagu hone chahiye lekin wo enforce nahi hote hain challenges that uh, you know what tribe you were saying earlier where 
welfare and productivity are not in conflict, but clearly you can get very high productivity with very poor welfare. This won't be high productivity though, it'll be low to average. You could improve the standards here and you'll get more milk from the cows, I believe. Do we see much higher productivity in, in Buffalo if they kept better? I wonder. Yeah, because I can imagine it's like the, it's a water buffalo, right? And uh, and they're most happier in the ponds and uh, wallowing in uh, uh, water. And uh, we, and here they are just offered to water twice a day. And clearly their bodies get more dehydrated. You can visibly see these animals are uncomfortable. And I think in principle there is enough research to prove that if the animals are not comfortable, and we can see that, you know, uh, buffalo with the froth coming out of her mouth. So if animals are not comfortable, that might have an impact on productivity. Only because you said that the owners are so well off, they're clearly yeah. doing a good business out of it. Yeah, but it's a very unsustainable system because animals are being just used for two or three lactations and then they are sold off for slaughter and replaced with new animals. Mm -hmm. So if they had to keep these animals for longer, but then, you know, this is also, is this the best possible use of that animal? We need to question that because the, if, you know, we, uh, what, what are we um, saying that the animal's life is not just, you know, the animal do not deserve to live just because we cannot keep them in a good way. Uh, the animal could have lived uh, for much longer, produced for much longer. Uh, a buffalo takes three years to mature, I believe, uh, and then only she has her first calf. So it's a lot more pressure on the food, water, and all the inputs that has gone into that calf when she became a buffalo and start uh, cowing. So if we can prolong her life, then uh, productive life, then that is also uh, that can also justify the resources that we have already invested in her, rather than just slaughtering and selling it and exporting the meat. Problem with the problem with the buffalo is that uh, it is not sustainable to have the buffalo out in the open because the buffaloes do not have sweat glands and that's why they wallow in water. So they have to be in a pond. But because pond water or water in general in such abundant quantities are not there, they make these poor sheds. So actually, the poor shed it looks poor, very poor. But the buffaloes are much more comfortable there. Then right out under the sun, under the sun they just protect. Yeah, that's why we suggest some you know low cost or no cost solutions. For example, when I go to these villages, I see uh, people would just simply tie their buffaloes under the uh, tree. You know, there is like no cost solution, absolutely. Plus, you know, I've seen women using their old saris or you know bed sheets to create uh, artificial shade you know, tie from one tree to another tree and create artificial shade. So it's just, I think what is restricting is that uh, it's the attitude which needs to be changed. That yes, it is possible to keep these animals in better systems and in good ways, it is possible. And there are a lot of low cost and no cost solution. In fact, we, um, we work with a lot of dairy industry and we did a pilot project to see the improve if, if improvements in welfare has any improvement on productivity of the animal. And there were five dairy companies which were part of uh, this project and they collected milk in a small holder uh, style. And one of the dairy companies, they uh, improved the availability of water. So these cows were just given like one or two buckets of water in morning and evening and then they were provided, they just bought some drums and they um, and then cut it into half and provided it for you know one drum between two cattle and they provided twen water 24 hours to them and uh, and monitored their uh, morning and evening milking for three months and they reported about uh, a 14 percent increase in milk which is like which is a lot i'm not sure if there were other factors or as well but then uh, qualitatively, when farmer was interviewed, he said that I think my animals are more comfortable. Uh, I think uh, you know the milking is much more easier for him. And like he, the farmer was very happy. I have a testimonial from a farmer who used to keep his cattle tied for 24 hours, and then uh, he adopted a system by just making a. Um, like he, he had some, you know, they did some construction in the house, and they had a lot of uh, long uh, poles 
you know which were uh, which they had to discard so he just you know experimented a system where he used this discarded construction material to create a paddock for those cows and during the daytime he would just allow his cows to go and sit in the paddock so he said that there is better water intake uh, he feels that because the cows get to move around uh, they can uh, digest their feed better uh, plus they can um, uh, he said that uh, he finds his cows are more healthy and uh, um, and there was artificial there were trees on the top so there was artificial shade and there has been like whosoever has tested animal welfare in indian conditions obviously which did not require much investment uh, they have always uh, given positive feedback so i think it's more about you know getting out of our bubbles and thinking out of the box and seeing that how we can help animals in not so expensive ways initially and once we see the benefits i'm sure we'll be motivated to invest in welfare thank you yeah good so it's back over to dr prasenjit i think we've we've uh, presented all we need to present and uh, we need, yes. now need to wind up we need to wind up yes is it copy is this a special question copy in your system? Yeah. And would you mind just putting the presentations on this course material? Would you have it in a folder? Thank you. So uh, we will wind up this coursework with the mandatory presentation of the degree certificates. Not degree, sorry, mm -hmm. certificates. I uh, these <laughs> these certificates carry one credit course, one credit point. So JU can give you or can offer you one credit for this if your institution or university would like to accept it. Uh, because this is passed through our academic council and uh, you can always write to us that please give me a certificate that I have done a one credit course. So this is a certificate for that. So it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it, it's not only a remembrance of this coursework, but also uh, gives you some credit for it. So as I uh, said before, I, uh, I'm sorry that we do not have all the certificates, but whatever we have, I request uh, uh, Professor Clive Phillips to hand over the certificates. Mr. Ritash Chandra. As long as you do the names. As <laughs> far <laughs> Well done, and it's so nice to meet you. Well done, yeah, very nice to meet you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Kumar. Thank you. It's more than a couple of bucks. Well done. Yeah. So nice to meet you. We'll, we'll stay in touch. Manish Kumar, how are you doing?
कुलदीप प्रकाश सिंह Amit Sharma. It's true. It is. Yeah. Especially when you don't know all the way down. Which one have you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Shailesh Kumar. Thank you, everybody. That's all I have. The rest of it, I think I'll have to pack in an envelope and send to you. Uh, we'll get it in within one week. I had a little presentation for Dr. Krasenjit as well for your uh, all your hard work um, in supporting these animal welfare courses. Um, thank you so much. Education for Animal Welfare is a book in a series yeah. we produced, but thank you for inviting me and thank you for supporting for, for Animal Welfare. Thank you for coming and I, I hope we can keep our uh, you know, relationship. Yes, it's been my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Copy the entire folder. Do you want to do it? <laughs>